Welcome, everyone. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects uh, uh, to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. So it's um, uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Seth to you uh, today. I think he's well known to many people in the audience having done his PhD here with uh, Sandra Nicholson and uh, Nick Nicola, uh, working on structure function uh, aspects of the SOX box. That segued very nicely into a postdoctoral period at NIH with Dan Kastner, working on genetically determined uh, periodic fever syndromes associated with IL-1 dysregulation and coinciding with um, a really exciting sort of emerging biology around um, inflammasomes. Uh, Seth then extended that interest uh, with work um, in Dublin with Luke O'Neill, looking at environmentally triggered um, R1 dysregulation and, and um, contributions to um, a variety of diseases. So we were fortunate to recruit him back to WEHI uh, to join the new inflammation division in 2011. And He's pursued um, those interests in the inflammasome and, and contributions to uh, diseases. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit uh, uh, about the work that he's done today. He has stepped in at the last minute. I think there was an unexpected gap um, in the Wednesday program. Um, so Seth um, talks with uh, infectious enthusiasm about this exciting new area of biology. And it's a pleasure to welcome him. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that uh, introduction, uh, Ian. Uh, tough week to give a Wednesday seminar with, with what you heard from Eric on Monday, that this place was you know, not a seat, seat free and uh, just absolutely amazing what he showed to us. And then you've got Vishva Dixit uh, next week, which again, uh, amazing stuff you know, on these inflammasome complexes. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction, a bit of a foray into before he deserves the main course next week. Um, so for today, what I'd like to do is to uh, reverse things around. So probably you're normally used to hearing people tell you about their data they've accumulated over the last few years. And then if you're lucky in the last five minutes, they'll discuss a little bit of unpublished data. But of course, if they go over time, uh, then you may not even get to hear that. And so today, uh, instead, the first half of the talk is going to be all unpublished data, uh, a new disease that we've recently identified and, and, and the molecular basis for that. Uh, and then in the second half, I'll go over some um, stuff that we published earlier in the year, um, which actually feeds nicely. And you'll see why I talk about it that way, because uh, they're very uh, complementary studies that play off each other uh, quite well. So what I'm going to be talking about today are these uh, periodic fever syndromes that uh, Ian alluded to. These are otherwise known as auto-inflammatory diseases. And auto-inflammatory is a really uh, fantastic word to me. It, it, it really is a beautiful balance to, against the autoimmune uh, diseases that you're probably more familiar with. And in those conditions, you have activation of the adaptive immune system. Uh, but in these conditions, you have activation of the innate immune system. And so the genes that are mutated are your innate immune sensors. Uh, and uh, you don't see any activation of uh, T and B cells. Uh, and you usually don't see any uh, infectious uh, organisms uh, present. However, I should say that as the, these diseases have become better studied, we, we do now know about some rarer conditions where we do see overlap manifestations between autoimmune and autoinflammatory. And sometimes the patients with these autoinflammatory conditions uh, will develop some infectious diseases as a consequence, although mostly you would assume these patients to be actually uh, a better, uh, more resistant towards various infections because their immune system is souped up to such a great extent. So normally, I think when I introduce these uh, autoinflammatory diseases, I give the example of the mutations that are in uh, the innate immune sensor NLRP3. Uh, but actually, today's talk is going to be mostly about a different immune sensor, something called pyrin. Uh, pyrin is mutated in this disease called familial Mediterranean fever. Uh, and these are the sort of cardinal syndrome uh, features that you'll find in familial Mediterranean fever. Uh, the, the skin manifestations that you find are an arithmetous rash, a sort of a flat hard rash that you can see in the lower extremities of this individual here. And this is what it looks like uh, histologically. Frequently, there will be uh, inflammation in the joints. And you can see on an aspirate some polymorphonuclear cells in the synovial fluid from an individual here. And really, these individuals are suffering from uh, bouts of fever that last from of, of, around about one to three days. And those episodes happen uh, regularly every month or so uh, throughout their entire lives. <coughs> 
So this systemic inflammation is actually uh, on the milder spectrum. I think you can see that these disease uh, manifestations are not particularly severe. But the issue is that um, while for me and you, you know, we, we're also experiencing inflammation, for example, when we get uh, an infection or the flu or something like that, and, and our, our acute phase reactants uh, increased, and, and one of those is serum amyloid A. But for these individuals, they experience these bouts of inflammation uh, you know, every month for their entire life. Uh, and they're quite prolonged you know, over one to three days. And the serum amyloid A can actually build up to quite deleterious levels and, and get deposited in the kidney. And this is a biorefringent sort of assay showing you the deposition of this uh, amyloid-like protein uh, that can actually lead to, to renal failure and death if, if not treated appropriately. So uh, the, the treatment of choice actually turns out to be a small molecule uh, discovered entirely by chance, something called colchicine. It's a microtubule inhibitor. Uh, some of the information about why it works is, is, is quite uh, opaque, but I think we've got some more evidence I'll show you later on in the talk today, uh, reasons why it might be a good therapy in this particular disease, and it might work in these patients. So one interesting thing about this disease is that the, the mutations that are commonly found in the gene MEFV, uh, standing for Mediterranean fever, and, and the protein that it encodes, pyrin, uh, sort of originated, originated in Mesopotamia, in this Mediterranean area, uh, back in ancient times. But that due to the diaspora of certain populations out into the world and various trading routes like the Silk uh, Route here, um, uh, the, these variants have been then found in other populations uh, as well. And, and they found at actually quite high rates in certain populations. And so although in its uh, recessive state these variants don't cause any disease, of course when they're homozygously inherited that's when you get the disease for Mediterranean fever. There is some sort of subclinical evidence of inflammation in the heterozygous carriers of these variants. But the uh, underlying assumption has been that uh, because these variants are found at quite high levels in certain populations, that they might actually be conferring in their heterozygous state where they don't cause disease some advantage against some sort of infectious pathogen. However, no particular pathogen was really known about for a long time that they might be uh, fighting against until recently. And so a really fantastic paper from uh, Feng Xiao's laboratory identified uh, pyrin as being an immune sensor activated by different bacteria that could all influence rho GTPases. So, um, for example, there's this TCDB protein, which is a Clostridium difficile toxin B, uh, and that has been found to activate pyrin in this sort of assay here, which is a, a sort of good inflammasome assay, and I'll give you a bit more introduction about it on the next slide. But just suffice to say that in 293Ts, if you put in something called ASC, an adapter protein, which is in red here, normally it's uh, cytoplasmically distributed within the cell. But if you put in a, an inflammasome sensor, one of these innate immune sensors here, you can see some small amount of specking where it redistributes from a cytoplasmic localization into a, a punctate perinuclear speck within the cell. And that's indicative of sort of inflammasome activity. You know, but these are sort of low levels of activity that are just from overexpression of the proteins in, a, in an artificial system, but that when you really get things going and you trigger pyrin effectively, you can see dramatic uh, reorganisation and high levels of specking in almost all the cells, indicating that this is really the sensor uh, of the TCDB protein. And I'll go on to show you today part of the mechanism by which uh, pyrin gets activated by TCDB. So just to give you a bit more background around how this all works, um, this is a now extremely out of date uh, schematic to show you the inflammasome. We've got this pyrin innate immune sensor. All of these uh, immune sensors that I'm talking about today function within the cytoplasm of the cell and they have to detect these exogenous signals like this toxin uh, indirectly. So, for example, in TCDB, we know that it modifies, uh, inactivates the Rho GTPases, but we didn't know about how this modification then links to the activity of pyrin, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. This is the inflammasome complex, this ASC adapter that oligomerizes into this speck within the cell, and that triggers the caspase 1 enzyme to cleave interleukin 1 beta into its active form, and that's what generates the deleterious inflammation that you see in those patients that I described. So, as I mentioned, this, this slide is actually quite out of date. And at the time we wrote this, we had bars from pyrin going to caspase 1, to NLRP3, and to ASC. And we didn't even have any arrowheads on there because we didn't know uh, whether this pyrin molecule uh, was originally, when it was knocked out of mice, su suggested as an um, uh, inhibitory molecule. Now, actually, those mice were made incorrectly, and it looked as though they put the, the knockout allele uh, into the second exon, and actually the, the N-terminal domain was still expressed and maybe activating uh, this 
pathway, which is why they thought it was a loss of function mutation. But actually, we've got a lot of really good evidence now that the mutations and this disease are activating mutations and that they go straight through ASC. And so we've been able to elucidate this uh, in more detail. Just to put this in more context, there's a bunch of other diseases with mutations in other pathways that seem to feed into the same uh, event of inflammasome activation. This is mevalonate kinase. Um, uh, it's, it's mutated in hyper-IgD syndrome. Originally, we had this pathway with RAC1, PI3 kinase, and PKB. But now there's a, a new set of data that's unpublished from a couple of laboratories. And it turns out this is actually all upstream of the pyrin inflammasome. And so that's uh, going to be coming out in the next um, months uh, later this year. PSTPRP1 is mutated in Parper syndrome, and that we know directly interacts with pyrin. Uh, but there's some work in our lab that's on ongoing now to work out uh, how that linkage works and, and how that mechanistically uh, it, 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 I, I activates uh, this pathway, because that's not currently known. Most of the work's gone into the function of NLRP3, this immune sensor, and that's been important because it's not only mutated in these familial rare conditions with these cryopyrin-associated periodic fever syndromes and diseases similar to what I showed you earlier, but also it's expanded our understanding of inflammasomes into the more common uh, diseases because it can detect a whole variety of exogenous danger-associated molecular patterns. Things like um, uric acid crystals in gout and cholesterol crystals in uh, atherosclerosis and amyloids in, in Alzheimer's disease, for example. So somehow these destabilize some homeostatic pathway. Uh, it could be things like mito mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. It could be um, phagosomal destabilization. Uh, and then this seems to activate this intracellular platform for uh, spec and uh, IL-1 beta production. But broadly speaking, because we identified all of these pathways, uh, we can think about um, you know, blocking interleukin-1 to, to treat these sorts of diseases. Um, we didn't just identify activating mutations in these genes. We also found loss of function mutations. So for example, this is the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. It's the natural break on this inflammatory pathway. And we found uh, homozygous loss of function mutations in the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist again cause another periodic fever syndrome, quite a severe one, in fact. Um, and so this this is what these sorts of diseases look like in terms of their skin manifestations. They range from the sort of flat and hard erythematous rash I showed you in familiar Mediterranean fever through to the more urticarial or hive-like rash in the cryopyrin-associated periodic fever syndromes and hyper-IgD syndrome, and then into the very severe pyoderma gangrenosum that you see here, the neutrophilic dermatosis in these patients with Parper syndrome. Uh, and finally, the deficiency of the interleukin-1 receptor antagonists the very pustular skin lesions of these individuals. All of these are very robustly treated by the therapy uh, that, that blocks interleukin-1, this anakinra molecule, uh, which is essentially, it's, it's just the same recombinant molecule, the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And you can see very dramatic therapy, uh, therapeutic applications successfully treating the skin. Uh, and also these patients have bone inflammation and very systemic inflammation. Those markers all resolve terribly rapidly, uh, although it's, it's different to different extents in the different mutations. But for these patients with the deficiency of interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, very rapid. Uh, and so they're, they're all essentially IL-1 beta activation disorders. Okay, here's a, a, a new disease that we've recently been working on. Um, it's a familial neutrophilic dermatoses. The um, manifestations of the disease I'll show you on the next slide look very similar to some of the manifestations I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, so clearly we were thinking about something that was auto-inflammatory in nature. Uh, before going too far, I should mention a lot of the people who've been involved. Uh, Isabel Giroux um, has done a lot of the genome-wide linkage uh, in this very large family with this dominantly inherited disease. Uh, Vasiliki uh, has done exome sequencing in some of these individuals. Uh, Serge and uh, Karine uh, clinicians who've been involved in treating these patients. And Adrian's actually uh, of uh, Australian extraction working in Leuven in Belgium, and he's the geneticist who's done a lot of work on this family uh, as well. So here is what the, um, the disease looks like. As you can see, it's at the very severe end of the spectrum with a very severe neutrophilic dermatosis in uh, some individuals, and also a very postular acne that, that many of these individuals suffer. Here's some histology of the skin. You can see a very dense neutrophilic infiltrate affecting a vessel quite deep down in the dermis of the skin of these individuals. So quite a severe uh, skin manifestations uh, of this disease. Now, due to the very large nature of this family and the fact that it was dominantly inherited, uh, it was possible to do some uh, genetic linkage analysis. And what you can see is that there's a, a small region on chromosome 16 which is present uh, and associated with the disease uh, in all of those individuals uh, from this large family. Now, actually, the Mediterranean fever gene uh, that encodes this protein, pyrin, is also in this linkage region. Uh, 
Um, but, you know, really that disease I just showed you, those disease manifestations, look nothing like the mild disease that is familiar Mediterranean fever. And so, uh, clinically speaking, uh, it was, was, was discounted as being a, an important gene within this region. However, um, further analysis was performed, and so this was exome sequencing of two trios, two, unaffect, two affected individuals and one unaffected individual, and two separate trios from different parts of the family, and that really carefully showed that there was absolutely no other non-synonymous variant in this linkage of uh, region, and that the only mutation that could be identified, I think there was one other synonymous variant, so that not, not leading to a coding change in, in a gene. This was the only non-synonymous variant, and it was in the Mediterranean fever gene. It was a serine 242 to an arginine, so towards this end of the protein, the N-terminal end, so not really located near the other mutations that cause uh, FAMU Mediterranean fever, so these are the sort of heterozygous mutations you get in this gene that cause this recessively inherited disease. Um, uh, and, and, and they're down this, uh, in this spry domain that I used to work on when I was working with, with Sandra back in my PhD. Um, there's actually some dominantly inherited, rarer cases of familiar Mediterranean fever. Again, it's the milder disease, but you can see it being dominantly inherited over a few generations. Uh, and again, these mutations are also down in this other region of the protein here with like deletion of M694, uh, methionine 694. So this was really a different mutation and, and, and it peaked our interest quite a lot about why it might be associated with the disease. The serine is highly conserved, and you can see that here across uh, multiple different species. And that's interesting because if you look at these variants in familiar Mediterranean fever and you ask um, what are they like in some of the more ancient species, actually the mutated version, the one that gives disease in humans, is present as the wild-type allele in some old world primates uh, and, and monkeys, for example, suggesting that maybe if, if these variants are protecting humans uh, against some sort of infectious disease, maybe those, those old world primates are also encountering the same pathogen uh, in their environment uh, the whole time and why they might have um, the, these variants in their pyrin uh, gene as a wild type. So what we were interested in is to start with, you know, this is a large family with the serine 242 to an arginine mutation. Are there any other families out there who might have the same mutation? And because pyrin has been sequenced very thoroughly um, due to the disease familiar Mediterranean fever, uh, there were a couple more families we identified quite quickly. The first was a family uh, from France, uh, a particular individual just with the serine 242 to an arginine mutation, and a very similar disease spectrum to the disease I just showed you with severe neutrophilic dermatoses. Um, this says recurrent fever, but actually the fever that these patients are experiencing is much more severe than for Mediterranean fever. It's not just going for one to two days, it's really pretty much constant. They have a, a really severe systemic inflammation just the whole time. So their acute phase reactants are upregulated. They're also experiencing the arthralgia uh, and the muscle soreness, the myalgia uh, as well. The cardiomyopathy was observed in just one individual from the very large family I showed you to begin. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's associated with this disease. And similarly, the anemia was present in a large family in a number of individuals, but it wasn't really characteristic, and we don't see it in these additional families here. The pyogenic arthritis is found in the disease Parper syndrome, and we don't see that in this disease. Serositis is more common in familial Mediterranean fever, and we also don't see that uh, in most of these families. With the exception of the second family, uh, the second family from Lebanon was a little bit odd because um, the affected individual did not just have the serine 242 to an arginine mutation, they also had a familial Mediterranean fever mutation. And um, I think to a certain extent that's, that's affected the presentation of this disease and they do have the serositis. Their skin manifestations are quite odd as well, being extremely hyperreactive to, to different sorts of environmental stimuli. Um, so this is quite a, an unusual disease presentation. Also, you'll, you'll note that um, the parents, each one had one of the mutated alleles. So one had the serine 242 to arginine, one had the FMF mutation. Both self-report as being clinically normal. Um, they haven't actually been to the hospital, so no clinicians have seen them face to face. Um, but it does suggest that this individual is not experiencing the dominantly inherited disease that I showed you is clearly inherited over multiple generations in previous families. And so maybe there's incomplete dominance, uh, incomplete penetrance uh, of this disease in some individuals. I forgot to mention these parents here, we, we could not identify, uh, could not obtain DNA, so it hasn't been sequenced. So that's 
what we knew of uh, circa about you know a month and a half, two months ago, uh, and I presented this data at a, at a conference uh, and was really um, fantastic to get someone come up to me afterwards. Uh, my friend Sinitra came up to me and said, you know, look, we've got this family. We think they have pretty much exactly the same disease. Uh, we, we see the myalgia and the, the really prolonged fevers, uh, the neutrophilic dermatosis, and, and it looks nothing like FMF. And so we sequenced, he'd done exome sequencing on this family and identified the serine 242 to arginine, but just like before, had discounted it. And he thought it wasn't related because that just disease didn't look like for me Mediterranean fever. Again, you see the dominant inheritance, uh, and I think now, you know, together with all the families that I've shown you so far, and I think there's one more family that we're still trying to characterise, this is clearly a sort of a new disease entity, uh, and it's, it's very different from FMF, and though, therefore we've proposed another clinical name for it of pyrin-associated autoinflammation with neutrophilic dermatosis or, or PAND. So, you know, at this point, this is where we really came on board, and, and, and we wanted to ask, you know, okay, this is a different sort of mutation in a different disease. Is it due, due to activation of the inflammasome? Is it due to IL-1? Can we treat the patients? And so here is some preliminary sort of data we generated. This is that ASC spec assay I showed you from Feng Xiao's laboratory, a, a modified or a very similar version. You've got the ASC molecule with the inflammasome forming these specs. You put in the pyrin, and you see lots of specs spontaneously. But if you put in the mutant version, then you get uh, a lot more. And so that shows you that there's increased inflammasome activation. Now, I'd appreciate that that's not terribly quantitative. Uh, and so what we've done is we've got a, um, a facts-based assay which we can use to quantitate those specs. It actually is really funky, and, and we got some help from Caroline Holly and Kate Schroeder to do these particular experiments, but we run it quite routinely ourselves now. And so you simply take advantage of the, the GFP uh, width and or height or area, and when you put those out against it, one another on the axes, you can actually determine that the, it goes from being a cytoplasmic distribution to a, a spec, and you can see that quantitated here. And that allows us to run through multiple biological samples and get error bars and the confidence that we are really seeing differences. And that's quantitated for you down here. So these are the, the pyrin, just the wild type version. You see a small amount of specs. And then if you put in the disease mutation in the disease PAND, you see this going up to, uh, it increased around 40% of the cells. Um, and so that, that appears to be disease causing. You can probably just ignore the R202 to Q and the G304 to R. We just tested them because uh, there was a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that these were associated with a, another neutrophil-mediated disease, Sweet Syndrome. However, they, these are extremely common variants in the population, and, and not everyone has Sweet Syndrome. So I think it's unlikely that they're disease-causing, and we can't see any evidence that they are increasing inflammasome activation uh, in our assays. We also tested the familiar Mediterranean fever mutations, these two here, M680i and M694v, and I think you can appreciate that they don't seem to do much either. Uh, and, and this has been part of the problem and why people sort of thought, oh, maybe pyrin's inhibitory, and they couldn't really work out how it's related to inflammasome function, because they don't seem to do a lot in these sort of inflammasome assays. However, if you put the FMF mutation onto an activated PAN mutation, then you see a boost in the signal. So I think this, for me, is conceptually quite nice because the FMF mutations are a mild disease and they're quite periodic in nature. They only get the inflammation at certain times. And so I think that they really require some other stimuli in these patients to get the molecule activated and then they increase its ability to form an inflammasome, get dragged in and cause more interleukin-1 production. And so conceptually, uh, it agrees with the, the disease pathogenesis of FMF for it to work on an already genetically, in this case, or environmentally activated pyrin. And in the last half of the talk, I'll show you about some of the ways we think the environment might contribute to pyrin activation. We also have more evidence in the second half about um, how the FMF mutations might have a separate mechanism of uh, disease activation as well. So uh, here's a little bit of more of sort of in vitro data, um, trying to argue that there's increased inflammasome activation. We just uh, overexpress caspase 1 and then look for the cleavage, which is P20 down here. And when you increase the amounts of the mutant protein, you can see increased cleavage um, on, a, on a higher exposure bot. It's, it's, it's more apparent. And that's despite similar levels of, of pyrin expression. Uh, we get increased caspase 1 cleavage. So again, arguing for inflammasome activation. And this is a wonderful experiment that Paul Baker's done in the lab. And that's to overexpress in, in more, now we're getting closer to the, the human cells. These are human monocytic cells, overexpressing the pyrin S42 to R mutant and seeing increased R1 beta production from the cells. And we also monitor the death of the cells in a caspase 1 dependent process called pyroptosis. And we can see increased death of the cells here. 
And uh, uh, with the advent of CRISPR, we can now go in and genetically delete the various components we're interested in, and we can delete caspase 1 and get rid of this increased uh, activation, showing that it's really good inflammasome activation. And we can also delete the MEFV, the pyrin uh, protein. We can delete that from uh, this cell line. And this is the first time we've really seen the genetic deletion of MEFV in human cells. Previously, that was all done with SHRNA and came to the wrong conclusions. So when we delete it now, we can show that it's really not an inhibitory protein. Uh, and there's no spontaneous activation here. And it's not inhibitory. When we overexpress it, it doesn't uh, boost the signal. So the, the, the wild type allele doesn't seem to be inhibitory in any capacity. So um, now we get back to the patients, and uh, we measure their interleukin-1 and in their serum. And indeed, you can see interleukin-1-beta is increased in the patient's serum. Very hard to detect serum IL-1-beta. They're, they're very quite low levels, but it does seem to be significantly increased in these individuals. And the things that are downstream of interleukin-1, I, I didn't have space to show you all the different cytokines, but things like interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and IL-6 are, are known to be induced by IL-1, and they're all upregulated in these patients. We've also obtained um, skin from these individuals, uh, and James has done um, immunohistochemistry of the skin. From the PAND patients, you can see increased staining with the cleaved caspase 1, and that's a specific antibody that only detects the cleaved caspase 1, so that's quite a nice um, indication of inflammasome activation, and also increased IL-1 beta uh, in, present in the skin as well. Finally, um, staining for the pyrin uh, protein itself detects increased amounts of the pyrin, but I think that sort of elucidates for you one of the caveats of this particular experiment, which is that we're comparing inflamed skin in the patients to non-inflamed skin in controls. And so really a more appropriate control would be, say, psoriasis skin or another inflammatory uh, skin disease where there's no inflammasome activation, and that would indicate that this is specific. But what I've been arguing for over the last few slides is that there's very strong upregulation of the inflammasome in these patients, and therefore we should potentially think about blocking interleukin-1. Now, unfortunately for the very large family in Belgium, um, it's been unable to get them the drug uh, at present. Um, there's an orphan drug status company, Sobi, who have the molecule, and they, they, they've agreed to license it for the patients, but uh, the various uh, ethical situations have not been resolved about the, the clinicians being actually able to administer it within the framework that exists in Belgium. Fortunately, however, the smaller family in the UK, uh, Sinitia, can actually give anakinra to his patients. And this is what he's done. Uh, and this is measuring C-reactive protein, a, a surrogate for the inflammation that these patients are. It's an acute phase reactant present in the serum. And what you can see is that... Um, for this individual, a mother in this particular family, she's really had, uh, for every time she's been to the clinic, absolutely you know, increased above normal. The five, below five would sort of be considered normal. She's really never had a normal uh, inflammatory CRP level. Uh, and that's been despite multiple high-dose uh, courses of steroids. They're not listed because they've been fairly um, un undocumented, but high doses of steroids over multiple years. And a more rigorous treatment with methotrexate to try and modify the disease more recently, which failed. But you can see anakinra blocking interleukin-1 dramatically resolves inflammation almost immediately uh, and has been a profound and sustained remission ever since then. So, you know, now her son is going to get the therapy, uh, which is going to be great as he's going through adolescence with the very severe pustular acne. And hopefully all the patients that I've uh, identified for you so far, they'll all be able to get the drug uh, and, and, and get some benefit. So um, I, I gave this talk to my wife, Lisa, last night, and she told me I needed a summary slide at this point. So, uh, so that's, that's here for you now. So that disease was pyrin-associated autoinflammation with neutrophilic dermatosis. Uh, it's, it's a relatively new disease, that, that, but, but there's instances of these uh, pre-existing in the literature, uh, and we've identified some of those for you there. Um, uh, this is caused by the mutation serine 2421 to an arginine. It's dominantly inherited, although I should say that um, perhaps there's an incomplete penetrance in some families. Um, it's characterized by very, very long periods of fever, pretty much constant fever, arthralgia, myalgia, and the very severe neutrophilic dermatosis that you saw. And, and many of these are quite clinically distinct from FMF, whereas we don't see things like um, serositis very commonly uh, in these individuals, which are more characteristic for FMF. We think the FMF mutations uh, and the S242 I have different mechanisms of inflammasome activation. I'll show you more data that argues that point later on. Uh, and finally, um, a really great um, therapy uh, with treatment with blockage of interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, or blockage of interleukin-1. Okay, so that's not where this story ends. 
this serine 242 to an arginine mutation is actually terribly interesting from a mechanistic standpoint. So um, we thought we'd do something intelligent, and, and we just did some uh, immunoprecipitations of the, the wild type and the, the mutant pyrin, and Laura Dagley very kindly helped out with these experiments. So he, here is the, the star just showing you the, the protein we've pulled down. This is in 293 T cells. And we just asked, you know, are there any proteins bound to one and not the other? And, and the only band we could sort of find was this lower molecular weight band down here. Uh, and then Laura sort of told us that uh, this band corresponded to the 1433 proteins. So at that time, you know, the 1433s are these sort of homeostatic proteins present at very high levels in almost every cell, and they're pretty common. They bind to lots of different substrates, or, and, and, and specifically to, to phosphorylated serines in multiple different substrates. And so we were not terribly excited about the prospect of working on them. But uh, we got a significant amount of confidence because earlier uh, there was a prior paper that made the exact same observation as us. And this is that they found a couple of different isoforms. We found six out of seven isoforms, but they only found two isoforms. Of the 1433 bound specifically to this serine uh, in pyrin. Uh, and so that made a lot of sense for us to continue to work on this. Now, this paper was um, now about 10 years old. Uh, and so at that time, they were not you know, privy to a lot of the information about the inflammasome. They didn't do any analysis of the inflammasome, IL-1 production, any mechanistic studies of, of why this would be functional. But now we see this is mutated in our patient. It strongly suggests that um, this would be affecting the interaction of 1433 uh, and thus causing disease. So here are some more Western blots to argue that that's the case. And, and, you know, I really love these sort of Western blots where they come back so totally clean. I mean, this is that the patient mutation totally knocks off all the 1433 that was bound. Now there's no 1433 at all. This is a pan-1433 antibody, so there's really no isoforms of 1433 left bound to pyrin in this mutated state. So that's strong evidence that this is a part of the mechanism of the activation. But I alluded earlier to you that this pyrin molecule can sense things like the Clostridium difficile toxin B and other things that modify these rho GTPases. So is this serine phosphorylation and the 1433 binding also important for the TCDB? Yes, it is. So if we add the TCDB, again, we knock off the 1433, uh, this inhibitory molecule, and instead uh, we've got an auto-activated pyrin, um, which I'll show you later on. So um, we've also done some mass spectrometry, and we can identify this serine as being phosphorylated. Uh, and fortunately, uh, because it's much easier and cheaper, we can also do a Western blot for this motif. So it's, a, it's an arginine or a lysine, then a couple of amino acids, then the phosphorylated serine, uh, then an amino acid, and then a proline. Now, pyrin doesn't have this proline, but it does have the arginine uh, and the phosphorylated serine. And when we use this antibody against this motif, uh, this is the band, it's pretty weak. I mean, the, these antiphosphoserine motif antibodies are, are typically not great. Um, but we can clearly see that this band is missing uh, in the, the pyrin mutant for the S242 to R, arguing that that's the, 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 the band, the, the, the particular part of pyrin that's being detected. And again, we put on this molecule, the TCDB, we activate it, uh, pyrin, and we lose the serine phosphorylation event here. So uh, what about the FMF mutations? Do they have the same mechanism? Do they affect the serine phosphorylation or the 1433 binding? Uh, we don't actually see evidence of that. So you can see here the FMF mutations. The um, phosphoserine band looks pretty much intact. It's not gone away like it is in the um, patient mutations with PAND. And the 1433 binding also looks pretty much intact. So more data suggests that the FMF mutations have a separate mechanism activation and that they, the way they work is by taking the activated molecule and making it more uh, have a higher uh, activity rate. So um, let me just s summarize that mechanistic data for you here. Normally, pyrin is, is serine phosphorylated, and it's auto-inhibited by the 1433 molecule. Presumably, there's a kinase. Well, not presumably. Actually, we know. We, we sort of co-submitted our manuscript with one that identified the kinase as PKN1 and PKN2, the kinases that do this phosphorylation downstream of the row, uh, and that if you put on the TCDB, you inactivate the row, you lose the kinase, you lose the phosphorylation, the 1433 comes off, and then you activate this whole pathway. Also, you can mutate the serine, that's what these patients have, and then you activate the inflammasome pathway. The FMF mutations, they're, they're a little bit separate. They activate on top of an activated pathway already. So just to put that in context for you, we, I think these observations are important for, for two reasons. The first is that um, this concept of an innate immune sensors in the cytoplasm uh, is one which has been of interest for a long time. It was originally thought that, you know, I mean, how can these immune sensors in the cell detect multiple different invading pathogens? And so the guard hypothesis was 
uh, proposed, and it works really well in plants where they've got these uh, guard proteins that are sensing or perturbed by the pathogens that are invading, and then when the guard is modified or perturbed, uh, then it pops off and you get an activated downstream pathway in innate immunity. 1433 is actually a guard protein in plants. But so now this really provides the first evidence in man that there's another guard hypothesis. It's a slightly different mechanism because the 1433 is not directly regulated by the, 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 the bacteria and the toxins. It's an indirect mechanism, but this would still be the guard preventing pyrin activity um, via which this mechanism works. And potentially there's other things that regulate 1433 and that could be a guard for other pathogens and other infections in, in, in a slightly different way. Secondly, um, it proposes a conserved mechanism by which these innate immune receptors are kept in check via serine threonine phosphorylation. Uh, and certainly that's again observed in the plant concept of innate immune defense, this guard hypothesis. They're serine or threonine phosphorylated. And there's actually unpublished data from the uh, LATS laboratory. Ike has shown that um, NLRP3 is also serine phosphorylated and kept in check uh, via a similar sort of mechanism, although they don't know the kinase or the, the guard protein that might be bound. But I, I like the concept that, um, that this is conserved amongst some of these patent records condition receptors. Okay, so that's um, the unpublished story. So uh, now I'm going to go on to the published story, and so I'll go through a little bit quicker. I hope that's okay. Um, but it follows on nicely uh, to this work that I've just shown you. So this, this new stuff, and, and there's a couple of new aspects that are unpublished to this story that I'll, that I'll mention while we go along. This new story is about, um, it's sort of a very wee high story. Actually, Ben Kyle identified this mutant mouse a number of years ago, although at the time he was not working here. But it's certainly been a focus of, of a number of people at wee high uh, over the years. I think you can see why it's called the Radius Mutant Mouse. It's, it's got a very uh, severe inflammation in the ears and also in the tail, um, characterized by lots of neutrophils and, and inflamed monocytes uh, in the ears and the tails uh, of these mice. So this was like, you know, your characteristic uh, ENU screen, just mutagenizing every gene and then identifying the mutation later on. And it turns out that this is um, a disease caused by a mutation, a loss of function mutation in a gene known as WDR1 or actin interacting protein 1. So this is a molecule that's required to depolymerize actin. So without it, you actually have a huge increase in polymerized actin within the cell. There's a phenotypic gradient. If you just lose all of your WDR1 function, for example, if um, there's a knockout mouse, that's embryonic lethal. But if you generate a, um, a mouse where one allele is deleted and one is loss of function, then you get a mouse which is uh, alive but dies shortly thereafter with a very severe inflammatory disease. So... Um, we noticed a few things, or rather uh, Ben Kyle noticed a few things in the initial publications like um, the increased neutrophils and that the neutrophils fail to migrate very appropriately to a chemotactic gradient. The platelets were also not produced normally um, because the platelet shedding off the megakaryocytes requires appropriate actin depolymerization. But one of the things um, that wasn't so clear um, because the analysis of the neutrophils was done mostly on like blood smears uh, was that the neutrophils look very, very strange when they're purified uh, via a percol gradient. So this is just a density centrifugation and that sort of stress, you know, probably um, just stresses the neutrophils a bit and, and all of a sudden um, they look really weird. The nucleus you can see here is normally polymorph polymorphonuclear, but uh, in these cases it, it's really just the DNA is bulging out of the nucleus. In some cases it even goes outside of the cytoplasm. And that's going to be uh, relevant later on. Um, so the disease in the mice, you know, it's got the altered platelets and the altered neutrophils, and that strongly suggests that it was something about the bone marrow. Uh, and so uh, it was originally published that you can treat the mice by giving them a bone marrow transplantation, put in the wild-type bone marrow, and then the mice get healthy. And again, that's an important thing to remember uh, for later on in the talk. So... Um, we were you know, thinking about autoinflammation with the disease, with the increased numbers of the neutrophils. And certainly, if you delete T cells, B cells, adaptive immune cells, you don't get rid of the disease. And then we started in on the sort of cytokines, things like TNF, GCSF, interferon gamma. They don't resolve the disease either. The cross to the knockout of GCSF is interesting, though, because that actually returns the neutrophil count back to normal but it doesn't get rid of the disease. So that suggests that maybe the increased levels of neutrophils are just a readout of the disease and not a cause of the disease. Uh, and so maybe this is not the cell type causing the disease uh, in, after all. And I should say, all of the work that I'm going to show you now is generated by uh, Mainly and Kim, uh, together with Ben Kyle uh, and Ben Croker. Uh, 
So here is an analysis of the serum cytokines. Uh, you can see we don't see elevated interleukin-1 beta, which is what we were sort of hoping for. And you do see increases in things like, you know, eotaxin, GCSF, MCP1, your classic sort of neutrophil-related cytokines. But we weren't very interested in these because uh, we didn't think the neutrophil was causing the disease in the mice based on the GCSF cross. We also saw increased uh, interleukin-10, and that didn't seem very interesting because, if anything, that should be getting rid of some of the inflammation in the mice. So finally, we saw increased interleukin-18. And that's really important because interleukin-18 is also generated by the inflammasome. So that inflammasome complex I mentioned to you, when you activate caspase 1, you cleave IL-1, you make the active IL-1. The same complex does the activation of interleukin-18. And so that got us thinking about uh, the inflammasome again. So we crossed the mice to those lacking interleukin-18, and we saw that they were protected, which was great. Surprisingly, we didn't protect them when we knock out interleukin-1 signaling. Now, I know I told you that the IL-1 levels were pretty similar, but you know, pretty much every other autoinflammatory disease we know of is treatable by blocking interleukin-1. So this is really the first time we've ever seen something that we can treat by blocking interleukin-18. Um, so it's quite novel and interesting for that reason. This data here shows you that the IL-18 is coming from a bone marrow-dependent cell, not from a non-hematopoietic cell, um, and so that's what leads to a delay in the disease um, progression when you knock IL-18 out of the bone marrow. Um, obviously, it's just a delay in the disease. The mice still get sick. There's probably more things going on than we're aware of here, but certainly the IL-18 and the inflammasome are promoting the pathogenesis of the inflammatory ear disease uh, and tail disease that I showed you in the mice. So, of course, we went back and we tried to track down the inflammasome that might be regulated. We started by knocking out caspase 1, and this delays the disease presentation. Um, but importantly, it's not related to caspase 11. This is another inflammatory caspase that um, Vishva Dix has done a lot of work on. He'll probably talk about that next week. Um, and there was an earlier paper showing that WDR1 could influence caspase 11 activity, but we can see no evidence in vivo that caspase 11 is involved. So that was important to rule that out. Upstream of caspase 1, we identified ASC as being important, so that, that's great. That gives us, it narrows down the field of inflammasome sensors that might be going through that particular adapter. Uh, and, but it's not NLRP3, it's not NLRP1, uh, some of the more commonly studied ones. It's also not NLRC4, it's not AIM2. But finally, we got back to pyrin, and of course, that's why it relates to the first story that I was telling you about today. So somehow, pyrin is a sensor for increased actin polymerization uh, in these mice and triggers IL-18 production. So you can see here that if we knock out the pyrin molecule, uh, we decrease the IL-18 uh, levels in the serum, which is good genetic evidence that that's how we've delayed the disease. Okay, what cell type's making the IL-18? Um, this took us a lo really long time to work it out. We were just doing our traditional um, macrophage assays where we take out bone marrow, differentiate it into a macrophage using MCSF for seven days, and then we give him a little IL-1, and we see totally normal levels of IL-18 secretion. And we did that way too many times, um, just trying to get it to work, and it, it doesn't work. Uh, and so finally, uh, Marty Gerlich, who, who many of you remembered, uh, remember, mentioned to me that you can actually get, at earlier days of the bone marrow culture, uh, monocytes uh, at around about three to, to four days. Uh, and so we suggested this to Man Liang, and he indeed tested that. And for the first time ever, we saw increased amounts of interleukin-18 uh, from these mutant mice. Um, so we were thinking about the monocytes maybe specifically making this interleukin-18. It's not a non-specific upregulation of inflammatory cytokines like TNF, uh, and instead it's, it's specific for the IL-18. We fact sorted these cells. So you can see here, these are your CD11B high mature macrophages. They don't make the increased IL-18, but it's the immature CD11B immature monocytes which do make the increased uh, IL-18 there. So we can further fractionate that population based on the MCSF receptor, CD115, and the granulocyte GR1 marker. So these are your neutrophils in the lower right-hand quadrant. You can see the abnormal nuclei that we mentioned earlier. Um, and these are your uh, resident and inflammatory monocyte populations at the top. And those are the two populations, these inflammatory, mono, re, inflammatory and resident monocyte populations that are making the interleukin-18 in these mice, uh, not the neutrophil uh, and leukocyte populations. But again, TNF levels are normal.
Finally, we depleted the monocytes in vivo using clogenate liposomes. And so these are liposomes that get phagocytosed by monocytes in this particular example. Uh, and then they just simply explode when they um, ingest the clogenate liposomes. And so that, that quantifies that for you in the blood of these mice. An intraperitoneal injection can get rid of the monocytes from the circulation of these mice. And pretty much they're protected for as long as we inject them every couple of days. Um, and you don't get the inflammation in the ears of these mice um, while we're injecting them. And this just quantifies the depletion of those um, monocytes from the mice there. So that's how we're treating the mice. What about patients? Are there any humans with the disease? There are. So there are humans who have pretty much exactly the same disease due to mutations in WD1. Very severe oral stomatitis. You can see in two families, I think there's four families in total. Um, this is unpublished data. I'm very uh, grateful that Douglas Kuhn, Stephen Holland, for this data being able to show you before publication. And also Paul Brogan uh, has presented a third family um, who have very high levels of IL-18, exactly the same as the mice. Um, actually, we probably could have identified this disease a little bit earlier in the human population if we'd been more observant. This was originally described in 1978. This is lazy leukocyte syndrome, the, the neutrophils from normal individuals migrating towards a bilayer. And here's some of these patients. The neutrophils don't migrate properly. And look, I think you can appreciate the neutrophil nuclei looks pretty much exactly like we showed you from the mice just before. Not only that, the humans have this huge increase in the microtubules, allowing their increase in actin polymerization. So although these individuals are now deceased, it's, it's highly likely these also have exactly the same disease, and they certainly look exactly the same as the patients I showed you on the previous slide. Now, the big problem if you have a neutrophil migration defect, and we don't see it in the mice because they live in a very sterile, relatively conditioned. We're not challenging them with infectious pathogens all the time. These patients are experiencing normal diseases out in the world, uh, and things like varicella zoster virus um, and other common pathogens uh, actually are fatal for these individuals um, early in life. Because we, we don't think you can simply delete the monocytes and cure these patients, um, they have uh, undergone bone marrow transplants, and in fact, the bone marrow transplantation has been very effective, and certainly that's what we observed in the mice as well. So that's very consistent, and it looks like that's going to be uh, the appropriate successful therapy for those individuals. So finally, just to, to, to draw together the mechanism of how increased actin polymerization might trigger pyrin uh, and try and bring that together for you. you know, and again, previously there was evidence from this in the literature we probably should have been paying more attention to. Here is pyrin co-localizing with the, the leading edge of a migrating cell uh, and this ASC as well, these inflammasome components, suggesting that you know, they really are localizing to sites that are rich in actin and polymerization. And here is listeria, and listeria have these actin comet tails. And so, you know, why would pyrin want to detect increased actin polymerization? You know, this is why. Because many different invading pathogens actually co-opt the host actin cytoskeletal machinery for their own purposes. Uh, and they lead to this increased actin polymerization. And again, that's where pyrin localizes with this, these inflammasome components. They go to this area and they sense the infections. So we used various different inhibitors of actin polymerization to show that we can knock out the pyrin sensing. So one of those is the alantrunculin B, just a sort of marine toxin that sort of paralyzes the cell. And it's hard to see, but that's the decrease here in IL-1 production that you get and you prevent pyrin activation. And colchicine, the therapy that I showed you, potentially this is why it's working in the patients with FMF is because of its effects on actin polymerization. And we use that here uh, to again decrease actin polymerization and also the interleukin-18 production. Uh, and so that shows you that um, with the cytokine production. Here's a couple of other actin polymerization inhibitors. And that shows you the um, uh, fitzifloidin reads out the actin polymerization increased in the, the cells from the mice, put on the inhibitors, decreased, and then that's why you decrease the IL-18 production from those cells from the mice. So um, broadly supporting the concept that pyrin detects uh, something in the pathway of actin polymerization. Finally, we went back to the, the Clostridium difficile toxin that activates pyrin. We put it on top of the mouse cells, and you can see increased IL-18 production here, and you can see increased IL-1 production. Now, you only see increased IL-1 production when we first give LPS, and that's because there's not much pro-interleukin-1 around to be cleaved and activated uh, without this TLR4 signal to generate a little bit of um, pro-IL-1 beta signal. And I think that's why this disease may be interleukin-18 specific, because at least in our mouse facilities, the mice are not encountering a lot of LPS. Uh, and so ma majority of the time, without LPS, they just make increased IL-18. Um, but perhaps in the real world, um, if there was more pathogens around, then they would get increased IL-1 also. 
This is not non-specific, so if you add nigerosin, which is an NLRP3 activator to the cells, uh, then you don't see any increase from the, from the mutant mice. So this is a really specific pyrin activation that we see uh, in the mouse cells. So uh, let me just summarize um, all of this for you now graphically. Um, what we have is this pyrin molecule that's serine phosphorylated and autoinhibited by 1433, and this rogue mechanism of kinase activation that keeps it like that. We've got the patient mutations that cause the disease PAND, um, and now we can also add to this with the patient mutations that cause loss of function of WDR1. And so when you lose this pathway, you lose the depolymerization of actin, you build up huge amounts of polymerized actin, and somehow this feeds into this pathway. So it could be direct. Cofilin's known to interact with 1433, so maybe that's how the actin polymerization pathway feeds into the 1433 directly. Or it could be indirect, and the rho GTPases could be the sensors that are perturbed by this defect in actin polymerization. So we've still got a, a few bits of this puzzle to put together. Um, uh, but, but broadly speaking, you know, I, I, in summary of this part of the talk, you know, mutations in WDR1 cause uh, human and mouse autoinflammatory disease, which is treatable using the bone marrow transplantation. And therefore, pyrin is, is this sensor of uh, actin polymerization. Finally, um, I'd just like to plug, I think what you've appreciated is that um, for our identification of these rare autoinflammatory diseases, we've really been doing that in collaboration with people from all over the world. Um, and, and we haven't been as successful uh, Australia-wide, and so that's why we've initiated the Australian Autoinflammatory Disease Registry, and this initiative is led by Fiona Mogadis in, in my lab. Uh, and it's essentially to identify and, and facilitate management and, and really mostly to identify those new novel mutations which require significant functional validation uh, to show whether they're pathogenic in, in these individuals uh, and apportion appropriate therapy uh, where that can be, uh, can be done. So that's ongoing now. And obviously, if you know of any clinicians who might treat patients like this, we'd be certainly very interested in, in talking with them. And of course, it remains for me to thank a huge number of people. In my laboratory, uh, Paul Baker and Dom have sort of contributed a lot to well, all the studies I've shown you, but uh, definitely into the, the, the new disease, PAND, that I showed you today. And, and that's how it's sort of color-coded here with the other participants, um, structural biology, uh, um, proteomics people, and many clinicians throughout the world have been a, a really massive help, in particular, uh, Adrian Liston, who's really leading the charge on the genetics uh, with that as well, and, and help from the people at IMB, Caroline and Kate. The Redis my story was uh, with, with a lot of help from Hazel. Manly and Kim really led the charge there, uh, and, and Ben Kyle and Ben Croker was the co-last author there. He really initiated a lot of that work uh, when he was at Weehide previously. And of course, I was able to show you unpublished data from, from Doug and Stephen, which is very generous uh, of them. And the Pyron cross was actually done at NIH by, by Jay and Dan. And Dean has helped us a lot with the Clostridium work, and we're hoping to take that further now uh, in the future as it's an activator of Pyron. So uh, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, that, that's a good question because it's thought that these uric acid crystals activate NLRP3. And, and certainly there's a lot of people who've shown that colchicine can inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome in vitro using colchicine as well. But it's a pretty potent molecule that does pretty dramatic things to the cell. It sort of cultures, culture condition concentrations we use it at. I, I, I would like to have a more nuanced understanding of that particular disease pathogenesis. The you know, patients who have the activating mutations in NLRP3 do not look like they have gout. So I wonder whether there's more to NLRP3 in gout than meets the eye. Is, is pyrin also being activated? Could that help explain? Is it due to defects in the actin side of skeletal machinery? Do they participate? I think they're really great questions. So I, I thought that colchicine was a microtubule inhibitor. Yes. So how's that feeding into the actin? So my understanding, and, and, and I may be incorrect, my understanding would be that when you perturb these microtubules, you, you have downstream consequences on actin polymerization. Because these microtubules are so fundamentally important for the way that actin accumulates and is stabilised within the cell, uh, that when you destabilise the microtubules, you have uh, indirect consequences on actin polymerization. So I believe that that's the way it functions. Because I mean, it's certainly been documented that that's the, the very high potency affinity interaction with colchicine is with these microtubules. Maybe there's also off-target effects of colchicine and it does other things that we're not yet aware of those, so there could be more to know there. The, the neutrophil lobulation defect, so what's the interaction there with the actin? I, I, I don't think that I understand it 
perfectly, so, so I, I don't know. You don't see it under sort of physiological conditions, but you do see it when we purify the neutrophils via those percol gradients, and that puts a little bit of sort of shear flow stress on the cells. So, so maybe that would be something you could see in vivo rarely, um, and almost certainly it's related to these defects in actin polymerization, but the details, I, I don't know. What is the explanation for the periodic symptoms in some of the diseases? So that, that, that's a really good question. And, and so I suppose one of the things I suggested was that because the FMF mutations, and that's one of these periodic fevers, because they seem to require that pyrin is activated by something else first, that maybe that's an environmental or um, you know, uh, time-dependent process in, in patients related to, for example, actin polymerization. If there are certain um, reasons why this actin polymerization might be altered at different times related to circadian rhythm or other things that we're not yet aware of, that could help to account for that. But I should say that in different diseases, the periodicity is very, very different. So um, you have to have multiple different environmental stimuli <laughs> to help explain that. Um, other, you know, reasons uh, probably can be hand-waved about, but, but, but I, I don't think there's any really good explanation. So it's not an infection or a pathogen? Uh, no one's identified anything that could be a good cause, infectious cause. Right. It does kind of follow <clears throat> a, a periodicity, doesn't it? And, you know, sort of like monthly or yeah. pre-monthly or whatever, or, uh, like for some underlying... Yeah, although it's different in the different diseases, yeah. it's very characteristic for particular patients. Yeah. Um, the IL-18 binding protein, I think, is um, effective in blocking IL-18, is it not? And has it been applied, <coughs> been applied in, this situ in your situation? It's only recently got to the clinic, and, and um, what's really important is to look at the balance of interleukin-18 and binding protein, because most of the time IL-18 isn't doing much, because IL-18 binding protein levels are quite high also. The one exception to that was, was recently presented at a conference, and, and it's this mutations in NLRC4, and there the balance of IL-18, IL-18 binding protein is totally out of whack, and they have a very severe a disease which is not treated by blocking interleukin-1, and they have now received the interleukin-18 binding protein and have successfully uh, been treated. But uh, the, the people presenting that work suggested that probably most other patients, like the ones I've shown you today, would not benefit from that therapy because it's already quite elevated. One more question. You mentioned sweet syndrome a couple of times, and I think you hinted at a genetic basis for that. Is that what you meant? Oh, I, I, sorry, I did go over that very quickly. No, there was one letter to the New England Journal where they suggested that the pyrin molecule and some genetic basis might be involved. But no, I, I don't have any evidence that that's the case. And I do not think that those variants that they saw in the gene were related to the disease they saw in those small number of individuals. Those variants were actually quite common in the population. So, so no, I don't have any evidence to that effect. Sweet syndrome is at least much more common than the conditions you were talking about. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's two o'clock. This remains the third case.